Hey, listeners, if you've been listening to our show, chances are you've heard the wonderful contributions of our favorite Tolkien scholar, Marilyn R. Pukila. Marilyn just launched her own podcast on our network called Rings and Rituals. Join me and Dr. Sarah Brown on our journey through the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, through the lens of ritual. Episodes drop every other Wednesday on the Rings and Rituals feed linked in the show notes. See you there. Welcome to the Shogun Podcast. We're the Lorehounds, your guides to the political intrigues of feudal Japan. I'm John. And I'm Alicia, and this is our coverage for Episode 10, A Dream of a Dream of the FX Limited Series Shogun. Today we'll start off with our hot takes on the episode, and then we've got a couple of historical notes after which we'll get into a full discussion of plot and character along with our favorite moments. We're going to save up all our listener feedback for the next podcast, which will be a season wrap-up. So please do send us feedback as we love to hear your thoughts and reactions. Send it to shogun at thelorehounds.com or head to the contact page on the website and use the form or record us a voicemail that we can drop right into the podcast. It's your last chance to write in about Shogun, so please get in your feedback ASAP. Support the community on Supercast or Patreon. Join the conversation on Discord and take a listen to our affiliate podcasts. There's links for everything in the show notes, and we'll talk more about it in the outro. So, Alicia, you're here, uh, but I think we have another special guest with us for a few minutes. Is there someone else lurking on this call? <laughs> you know, I, I may be podcasting from the inside of my car from another stage, and I may be dealing with the effects of uh, a long COVID recovery, but my skills are sharper than ever. So don't leave my body in a yard to fill the bellies of, of dogs. Mm. <laughs> Would you rather be eaten by fish? Uh, I think that might be an interesting experience, you know, because you're floating in the water and, you know, it could sounds be, it slow could be and fun. painful. <laughs> <laughs> You just kind of bleed out. Well, it's getting, it's, it's, we're starting the podcast off on a dark tone. <laughs> Okay. Well, I mean, I think suits the series. Okay. <laughs> it's true. Well, David's John recording from his phone, so please excuse his audio quality, but he'll be back on uh, on full swing for the season wrap up if you want to hear all his takes. Hot takes, everyone. Yeah. John, what, what did you think of this finale episode? I shared a preview of my thoughts on the Discord channel last night. <laughs> Under hot takes, I just wrote fucking masterpiece. Yeah. It was. It subverted my expectations in the best way. And that that phrase triggers me after Game of Thrones. But it's just the best way to describe what the showrunners did. I mean, they created a situation where we were all expecting for the last two episodes, one of them having this huge battle and Toradog is going to come out on top. This, you know, victor covered in blood and and just ruling over everyone. And instead, he's like, no, I already won without ever striking a blow. And that was an incredible moment. I mean, we're 15 minutes to the end. And I look at the I look at the time remaining and, I, and I'm like, how are they going to wrap this up? Turns out we don't need to wrap it up because Toronaga's already wrapped it up in the future. Right. Crimson Rain has already fallen. Yep. 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 And Crimson Sky was the Marico we made along the way. <laughs> um, yeah. What did you think? Um, what did you think, David? I was pretty impressed with this show. I don't want to get into my season thoughts, but the way that they brought this episode to a close was so confident and so clear-eyed. I was I, I was just enraptured with it. I was I was kind of transported while watching this. And and one of the big thoughts that I had was ending was so consistent with Toronaga character and what his motives were the whole time he was trying to avoid a war a mass war sure he'll sacrifice a few you know <laughs> best friends and trusted vassals but in the balance it's kind of a, a trolley uh, style problem 
where yeah he'll he'll sacrifice a few so that they're to avoid this large scale war and i think you know a couple of episodes ago they set that up with him as the young warlord that that lesson really went to heart for him and so to be able to tell that story and to tell that um that, that core motivation uh, of tornaga in such a quiet and subtle and uh, uh, just very, ethere- I don't want to say ethereal. There were some ethereal parts to this, but mm-hmm. it just had this, uh, this transportive element where I just felt like I was floating along the whole episode. And to be able to do that with an episode of television is an incredible feat. So hats off to the creators. And yeah, I was expecting, I was really, you know, oh, are we going to get some nice good fight stuff? And in, in some ways, I'm more satisfied than, than with that. I, I think that they, uh, they were very smart in how they played this out. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah I mean, I, I was hit super hard by this episode that um, it put me in a dark place for the rest of the day, I have to be honest. And I, was <laughs> almost, I was almost like not mad at it, but just like, oh, man, I don't need help accessing, you know, these emotions of despair and sadness. Uh, but I think that it's, it is a fucking masterpiece. It is, it was a perfect emotional punch, just the way they tied everything together and they gave each character the most appropriate, uh, fate. It's, it's a cynical show, but it is, it, it was always a cynical story. And yeah, I, I had to though, I had to compose a tanka, which is, you know, it's not a haiku. (laughs) It's a, (laughs) it's a uh, tanka is like it's like a haiku in that it's measured by um by syllables but it's not instead of the five seven five it's five seven five seven seven so okay this is my tanku for, for my tanka for mariko my heart is heavy spongy soft and sopping blood the maggots nibble but there's no black for blackthorn feasting just a bonfire of her words I think Yabushige would be very proud of you. That was awesome. <laughs> no, Yabushige would find a reason to nitpick it. Mariko would. He'd like be it. proud of you. <laughs> uh, yeah, but it was it was uh, it, it it was characters and scenes and stories that I will remember for the rest of my life. Yeah, yeah, definitely my show of the year so far. Yeah, I mean it's hard to beat in terms of quality, although. You know, there are other happier shows that maybe I walked away with uh, with more of a spring in my step. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's batting a, a 10 for me for sure. I just don't know if it's going to go to a, an 11, which is a, a game changer. Like, has it changed the state of the industry? No, in it's terms an 11. Of a, I'm just going to tell you you're wrong. You right think there. I know. Well, OK, fine. You think it's an 11. Yeah, I'm, I'm, <laughs> am, I'm, I'm at a, a nine. Oh, a nine. Okay. I mean, it's just there's there's little things like I know the the language thing, the European language thing, bothers me more than anyone else. That's fine. We all have our. <laughs> you, you're to saying die on. the the fact that they don't have anybody speaking Portuguese. Well, yeah, just the fact that they treat all European languages like they sound the same, and I guess that's you know sort of a nice reverse. Um, just in, in in general, the way that Westerners are, are treated in the show, as mm-hmm. is appropriate, it's from a Japanese perspective, and they're outsiders, and maybe we all sound the same, but it just made certain scenes more confusing than they need to be, and I don't know. They're just little things like that that I nitpick, but I think that this is still one of the greatest shows ever created. Quick yeah. shout out to uh, another podcast, Alicia. I didn't post this in the Discord yet, but there was... A good interview with uh, the showrunners uh, on the Watch podcast. Uh, Chris and Andy interview um, the showrunners, and, and there's a bunch of conversation about how they went through the translation process and actually how they resolved all of the a, a lot of those questions and, and issues. And so it's a it was really interesting to to get that feedback of they translated, and then they were like, then the the production folks on the on the Japan side were like. Oh, this is good, but it's not great. So they, then they went to the whole other thing, and then the actors added stuff. It was a really, at least on that side of the equation, it was a uh, apparently an extraordinarily well crafted uh, production in terms of making sure that yeah. the language was right. So, yeah, there's been good coverage also in the Prestige TV uh, feed, also yes. our, <laughs> our favorite <Agreed>. ringer. <laughs> well, 
I think that's enough hot takes. I think let's move into some historical context. So I didn't actually put this in the outline, but I just wanted to discuss a little bit about what happens next. And if you want a more full discussion of this, the show's official podcast does a good job of outlining everything. But this is a real thing that happened. I mean, not exactly in every detail, but this idea of, of the Tokugawa shogunate, which is the real world version of Toronaga, just takes over Japan, basically, and, and sets up the longest standing shogunate in Japan. It begins the Edo period. Edo, of course, becomes Tokyo eventually, and it lasts from 1603 to 1868. So past the U.S. Civil War, Torunaga is still, you know, ruling through his ancestors. And it's super impressive. It has its ups and downs because it is a very peaceful era. It's also very isolationist. I think the show did a good job of showing why the Tokugawa shogunate would be a little bit isolationist and a little bit wary of foreigners, uh, especially after being taken advantage of by the Portuguese and probably later the Dutch and English. Um, but it it was like kind of a Japanese renaissance where they're having, you know, all these arts and cultural cultural advancements. Uh, we saw Toronaga starting to set up Edo, right, with, uh, this is the official sex work district. This is the official church area right next to the sex work district. And but one thing they didn't talk about is that you know they he they made it um, Japan very isolationist, so they weren't so taken advantage of after that, and that kind of allowed this to thrive. Mm. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this was this was a real fundamental shift in Japanese politics. And, and the emperor basically, I, I know they were saying on the official podcast, the emperor was basically a figurehead during this period. And the Tokugawa shogunate really just ruled everything. Yeah, um, I think that it's, I, 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 you know, I don't want them to do a sequel series to this. You know, no. I think that this is perfect. Well, they already have is. one. It's Blue-Eyed Samurai. Okay, fair enough. I am going to watch that finally next. <laughs> but I would love if they did similar to the James Clavell novels, which again, I have not read, but I know that they are each um, focused on different characters in different periods and places. And I would love if this same crew with this same historical attention to detail came back and did more stories like this uh, in other parts of a, of Japanese or wider, broader Asian history. That would be very cool. Uh, a, a an anthology series would be great, even right. if even if they did it like American Horror Story and recast the same people every season, but as different yeah, sure, characters. I'd be okay with <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I think this production lasted something along the lines of five plus years for them to work on wow. it. Obviously, there was a wow a, a COVID curveball in there, but I I I agree with the point in that built a process and a knowledge base and they found actors and production companies and translator companies and uh, weapons masters and set deck and all of this kind of stuff that they built an incredible resource for being able to create this high level prestige drama. I would certainly be in favor of that if they were willing to dedicate another, you know, three, four, five years of their lives, they're producing something on this scale. I would. I mean, it's in. literally their job. So yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. It really is. <laughs> well, I guess I guess the biggest problem with it is one of the biggest reasons this show stands out is the authenticity to historical customs and historical, you know, costuming and language and whatnot. Even props. And, yeah. yeah. And every time you change periods, you got to redo everything from scratch almost. That's true. And so sure. yeah, I think it would still be a five year process to do another season. Well, but without the COVID curveball, as David put it, I think three years seems. Well, yeah, but then they Alicia's have to like, completely break three. it down. <laughs> <laughs> I've just set a reminder. I'll be checking back in. <laughs> We need to get you a job over at FX. You know, <laughs> yeah, I, I was listening to the official podcast. I, I only started the episode nine listening to the official podcast, but they had a really moving interview with Clavel's daughter, actually, who I guess was an yeah. executive producer on the show or some kind of producer. And she had said she praised the show and she said, you know, 
basically my dad was focused on the characters and storytelling. He was an entertainer first, but what FX added was the authenticity and the, the truth to history. Uh, mm. and, and that really made it come alive. And my favorite thing from that interview is where she said, um, where they sh scatter the ashes with Fuji at the end is mm -hmm. apparently where her own father's ashes are scattered in real life in that lake. Wow. Wow. That's uh, that's cool. That's a cool detail. I haven't listened to that one yeah. yet. Yeah. That's lovely. All right. Why don't we get into the full episode now? So I just wanted to bring back a theme that we've been discussing throughout the the season, fate, right? And this comes up a bunch during this episode because you have Torinaga talking about Blackthorn, saying it's not his fate to leave Japan. But isn't that just because Torinaga stranded him there, marooned him? I mean, <laughs> it's it's so interesting to talk about fate in the context of like, who is making fate, right? And then you right. have a similar thing where Yabushige says to him, what is it like to shape the wind to your will? And he's like, I don't shape the wind. I just study it. But but is that even true? Right. I mean, I think that that was one of that was my favorite quote of the entire episode, because I do think it is very true that the people who they're like, oh, you're pulling the puppet strings like, no, we're just studying uh, yeah how the way the wind blows the, the wind is a great analogy because it mm -hmm. is something you cannot control you cannot control the things in life like your son slipping on a rock and dying right but you can study these things so you know how to respond how to adapt and how to dance in the wind so to speak but Toronaga does sort of control the wind for other people. Right? He's at least blowing fans in different directions. I mean, okay. he's, <laughs> <laughs> he's got wind funnels set up. It's yeah. true. It's true. I mean, like destroying Blackthorn's ship, preventing him from returning to England is him shaping Blackthorn's wind, at least. Mm -hmm. It's really yeah. interesting to consider that. But I think you're right. That's that's a really good point that Toronaga really is a master improviser and he's sort of windsurfing, right? Mm -hmm. And the way exactly. that he, I, I think, you know, Tornaga at the beginning of the series is thinking and, and even even in the flashback to the Tycho's death, he's thinking, all right, now's not the time. And now it would be a revolt. But people are going to get really tired of disorder and I'm going to be there to bring them some order. I mean, and he's so Machiavellian, but better him than other leadership yeah, yeah. uh, that we see maybe in the present world. Anyway, I think it brings in an interesting as well as to how he I don't know that he predict he hoped that uh, Lady Ochiba would would come around in some way and so when he gets that letter from her there's that flood of release of emotion on his face present on his face that the the hope that he had hoped for mm -hmm. has has come through and it is. I think it is a really good analogy the the windsurfing thing, which is I can h put myself in this position and only hope. And if the wind blows the right way, then maybe I can catch this wave or whatever. Right. And when he does catch that wave of, of Lady Ochiba coming around, it's such a powerful thing because he now knows that he can avoid this war, that all of these deaths that he's had to um, order, suffer, uh, live through, uh, uh, connive to, to position people to die in these ways, it means something. And, the, and those deaths are, are not in vain, which I also think makes a really interesting commentary on his character. We've all been rooting for Toronaga. He's been set up as sort of a good guy for us. But you know, he is also not above uh, uh, ordering the deaths of some villagers to trick Blackthorn into... Uh, having a moral crisis moment to right. see which way he's going to land. Uh, so, you know, he's a complex character. And I, I think that's another thing I love about the show is, is that there's no simple black or white, good guy, bad guy. Toronaga is as much of a gaslighter and a, and a, and a manipulator as, he can be as cruel. anybody. Yeah. He can absolutely. be really cruel. And, and that is such an interesting character that we're rooting for it. It reminds me of Jamie Lannister, right? Is like we start rooting for him because he makes a turn around. Toronaga's almost the opposite, is he starts doing shadier stuff as the series goes on. 
as he gets more and more boxed into into positions, he's got to sacrifice bigger and bigger pieces to be able to, right. to get it done. Um, right. But then he has that ultimate uh, objective, which is to create a, a stable and peaceful Japan that can flourish over a couple of hundred years. Right. Yep. That's that's an incredible legacy. Uh, but it's the brutality of the moment and the brutality of the, the as much as. There is a, a culture of beauty and and uh, uh, life and and subtlety. It's also a place where um, loyalty and honor uh, uh, play these huge roles, and that sets up these these conflicts. So that when Blackthorn has his moment of crisis, is it hope or is it faith? You know, when M- M- uh, Miraji translates for him there, it's, uh, it's a really powerful moment. And so when you compare that to Toronaga's moment of when he has faith and hope that Toshiba is going to come around, it really does affect him. And, and Hironata Sanada really shows us that in his portrayal and in the character of Toronaga. The, just the face, the subtle facial and moment, uh, emotions of, of him like almost breaking out in tears because right. he's so right. happy and relieved. You know, what I love about this series is that, you know, people complain it didn't end with a big battle. We got a hint of it, of course, but um, I think that this is showing we're so used to historical epics like Braveheart and such, you know, the sacrifices that are made on the battlefield. And this show shows you that it's all a battlefield, you know, the entire political landscape. And this is about the sacrifices made on that battlefield, you know. Yeah, Marika, yeah. Hiramatsu, all of them. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's it's just because it's not at scale doesn't mean it doesn't have impact. Right, because these are important people that we're still talking about centuries later. Yeah. I think the case of Mariko, even her, like, they use some of her real poetry in this. I, right. I believe the, the and And the effect that she had and her death had and uh, the point was made on another podcast. They were like, here we are hundreds of years later talking about her and her effect and her impact of her words. Right. Uh, you so, know, the bonfire exactly. that she's made. Yeah. You know. mm-hmm. Gracia and the same with- really had a real mm-hmm. impact in the real world. Absolutely. Yeah. Apparently there are still communities that revere her in an almost saint-like way. Do you know, though, that apparently Adams, the real life Blackthorn, never met the real life Marco. Yeah. <laughs> like that was a oh, total really? fiction. <laughs> Never even met her. Oh, well. <laughs> real life Blackthorn make it back to Europe? No, he stayed in Japan. Time? Yeah, he did stay he in Japan. Left. Okay. Yeah. All right. So it's another nice little historical parallel there. That was another thing in this episode. There are a lot of little rhyming couplets. We talked a lot about that in, during True Detective, a, a show I know John just loves. It's going to rank I high in his list. Yeah. <laughs> but there's a lot of little rhyming couplets, like when Toronaga is in, um, having the audience with Yabushige, right? That was the same place where uh, uh, Blackthorn was first brought before. I believe it was Omi. No, Yabushige was there, so it was sort of reversed. Or when when Blackthorn presents his weapons to, to Omi. So there's a lot of little parallels and echoes throughout the whole thing. So I like that they, and I, I, I saw in the outline that you had, of the the dream sequence i don't know mm-hmm. if we should talk about that now or if you want to kick yeah that let's later. let's uh let's go into it right away you know the dream of a dream i kind of wanted to be like yeah did we like this because this was probably the most controversial part of the whole season I, I i was a little confused at first but on my second watch i really got what it did and and how it functions and i i, I liked the fact that we see the cross in his hand Never mind his uh, grandchildren. That you know, they're like, oh, he's he's a little, whatever. He's savages. Um, savages. The cross in his hand. It, it set me up the first time I watched it to go, oh, okay, he survives. He carries his love for uh, Mariko with him. Uh, you know, he's he's obviously uh, 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 prospered. And has had family, mm-hmm. is, you know, back in the back in Europe, and so it set me up to be thinking that oh, he's going to make it through, and <clears throat> all this other stuff is going to happen. And then when the when he's out on the water with Fuji and he lets the cross go, it was a big surprise for me mm-hmm. because I was like, oh, but in the dream, right? Mm-hmm. That's a foreshadowing, right? That's a jump to the future. 
And then I realized how they set up the dream that was just when he was concussed and unconscious. But but that moment when he lets the cross go is for me more poignant because they had falsely led me to this conclusion that right. he kept it and he, he lived. And so then when that moment happens, it's not just a pap sappy moment, but it's actually a very profound and and unexpected because I had a different expectation. They used they subverted the language of television on me, like, oh look, here's the foreshadowing, you know, and he, he survives. And it's like, nope, that's not what actually happens. And I so the first watching I was confused by it. The second watching I loved it and I thought it was a perfect device. Yeah, and, and he's letting go of the crucifix just like he lets go of his sort of European based dreams and ambitions in the scene mm. with Toronaga. Oh, yeah. That's a good point. Yeah, he says it's not his war. Yeah. Um I I thought that was like the most depressing part of the episode until I realized that it was a dream and you know <laughs> <laughs> and it was like, oh he's just gonna stay in Japan being a clown for Toronaga and rebuilding his ship forever. I'm like, yeah, well no, that's not a bad life to be honest. It's sounds way better at this point than going back to <laughs> Um, yeah, as you have in the notes, of bratty racist grandchildren. <laughs> <laughs> um, I it, it seems like a good life until you realize Tornog is going to break every ship. Oh no, it's crazy! It's an earthquake every single time that <laughs> you finish a ship. He had one <laughs> plank left. Don't oh, affect no. the water. I don't know. J- Japanese earthquakes are different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so he does have bratty racist grandchildren in the uh, in the dream of a dream. Right. And he does look full I of regrets, right? Can I, can I also just say, I thought that the makeup on him as an old man looked pretty bad. And I was like, <laughs> but then when I found out it was a dream of a dream, I was like, okay, I guess that's just a young man's picture of himself as an old man. <laughs> he can't imagine his face changing. Yeah. I will say that the the way that they use this device, and like I mentioned, you know, subverting the language of television, you know, we had certain expectations. It really reminds me of what uh, Noah Hawley does with Fargo, where they start out every episode with, this is a true story, the names have been changed. And it sets up this discordant uh, thing in your mind that then when the plot plays out and the characters play out, you get surprise and you get delight and you get to, you're, you're looking at the story and the characters from a different vantage point. So not only did the showrunners, you know, and, and all of the writers do just a beautiful job of uh, illuminating all of these characters in this time period, but they were really smart about television. And they were really smart about how to produce this season. And we can talk about it more in the, in the season end. But, yeah, I just thought it was a, a really clever device uh, and and – and did something that was unexpected in, in the show. And I think it added to the overall um, uh, uh, excellence of this season finale to bring this to a, clo- a, a, a complete and satisfying close. And I, I think that device does play some significant role in, in landing the landing the final episode. Speaking of, Closing. I guess the polls are closing on whether to go to war with Toronaga. And the council's meeting, Ishido is clearly clinging to power. And he has to stop everyone from taking a revote after an earthquake omen. Uh Ochiba already very doubtful here. Can I can I also add on Ochiba? The book makes very clear why she distrusts Toronaga, but the show never addresses it. I wonder why that is. So they said, uh, where was it? Maybe uh, it was in the Prestige TV interview, pod, uh, but the writers were saying that they actually, I think they filmed some s- stuff more related to the book where basically it's about her um, kind of being in love with Toronaga and having also he knows her secret about having had, uh, you know, the baby is not the Tycho's real son. And and that's why she had to like get rid of him or something. But I, I like the way that they just left. They made it more tied to her father because that feels more visceral to mm. us as an audience. Yeah, I hear that. I this mean, is- I, I think that the it's a really direct 
a, gr- a, a really direct slight that she perceives that in the book that uh, Toronaga saw her. She thinks that Toronaga saw her having an affair the day that the heir was conceived, basically. And she's gaslit herself into believing that that's the Tycho's true son. But she's like, Toronaga knows that there's something up with us. I think in another, in the hands of other showrunners or another network, there would have been a lot more playing around with these motivations. This could have been a, a three season television show. And so it, it really takes an act of courage and to constrain and to remove that kind of material from being on screen. And I, in some ways, been too obtuse or too sort of uh, gross to go into the whole legitimacy of the heir and did she you know find some farmer who looked the same part and what 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 I think it just um, by removing it it actually highlights it and it actually makes us want to dig more into the motivations and the characters and it, it's more enticing to not have that material just sort of you know obviously open and, and discussed about in, in the show and the characters and the, and the writing. It, it gives it a bit more mystery and a bit more nuance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, you know, as I'm currently working on our show guide for House of the Dragon and trying to keep track of who had affairs with who and who's who's an illegitimate child. Um, by the way, I, I wouldn't use that term in real life, but we're talking about Game of Thrones here. But anyway... <laughs> Legitimacy in terms of the throw, who has legitimate right. claim. Yeah, 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 yeah. A recognized uh, claim, yeah. So anyway, it's just this Ochiba thing feels like it belongs in that universe more than this show. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree. There's, you know, we've ourselves done plenty of comparing with uh, the political machinations of Game of Thrones. And that's, it's there. They're both just such rich, nuanced character studies that you know that's that's there to discuss and and th- that's a good basis for that but yeah this is definitely much less sensationalist this story especially the way that they've played it in this mini series and i really like that about it that it's it's still incredible memorable crazy things happen but it's all feels like it's in- inevitable in some way it, it's uh, comes from a natural human place Agreed. Not exactly. just for the sake of drama exactly what do we think about ishido being like no the Mariko's death was toronaga's fault he did it <laughs> <laughs> mm. I, I wonder desperation <laughs> yeah uh, and i just wonder how much the rest of the regents are going you know, they're playing along with the theater but that i i mean i guess um uh, what's his name? I don't have the show guy in front of my head. The uh, Kiyama. Um, how much Kiyama says, you know, oh, that a, that a regent could have ordered that attack. I thought that was cutting pretty close to actually voice those words in the council meeting in that moment. Right. Uh, right. But I did like that they said, uh, well, you know, it's the castle is not as safe as we were led to believe. <laughs> mm. Yeah, but I don't think that um, uh, Saeki or I believe it's Ido is the other lord. I don't think oh, no. any of them are courageous enough to stand up and actually challenge Ishido openly in this moment. Yeah, yeah. I, I think Ishido just shows again he does not understand the political nuance that's required to pull off what he's trying to pull off and he really needed Ochiba for that. But then, and I think that that's, I know that that's a change that they made for this show to make Ochiba and Mariko close childhood friends, but that adds so much to the motivations here and, you know, just shows um, you really need to understand personal relationships before you start trying to make moves around the chessboard. Yep. And, and I think that's part of, I think part of the story they were trying to tell us was Ishido did not grow up in, you know, playing the Game of Thrones. And so he didn't know how to navigate that. Wasn't there a line he even says uh, during that meeting that, oh, right. It was after the earthquake. 
and he says, we're not peasants here, you know, uh, being frightened by and everyone these. else is like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> so, and again, they were just playing with those subtleties where he even calls himself out there in that moment of, well, we're not all peasants here, but yes, you are a, a peasant. And uh, yeah, so I don't know what that says in a, in a larger conversation about a meritocracy and being able to rise to levels and what uh, a class-based system, how they look down at, I mean, they, Oshido is very much looked down at by the other nobles, um, but yet that is also his downfall because he doesn't know how to read the room and he's mm-hmm. he's trying to climb the ladder so aggressively. Mm. And had he not tried to climb the ladder so aggressively, he might have ruled on the Council of Regents for decades, like till he died. And there right. was there were some there were some early on indications that he's uh, got some good memories and and you know uh, well uh, well uh, appreciation of each other. I think he was buddies with uh, Yabushige from War and mm-hmm. Korea and other places. Yep. So, so there's you know and he hates bureaucratic administration. We we they, they showed that to us earlier on, so that another world would have been buddies with Toronaga and, and he would have been a, the, you know, maybe the, the hand of Toronaga or something like that. Right. You know, or a very powerful region. Yeah. But instead he, it's this um, clamoring for political power and, and to occupy this center space of uh, ultimate authority. And which makes me, I mean, I certainly don't want to be Shogun. I certainly don't want to be Tycho. So I don't know what motivates people to that to those ends, um, but it's it ultimately is his downfall. Yeah, is, is, right. You know, well, I think that maybe you know Toronaga, he is he does not come out of this looking like a great guy. You know, he <laughs> from from his closest friends to random village people, he goes on quite the killing spree to attain his goal. But I do think he genuinely believes that he has the best for Japan at heart, you know, that this, he, he thinks he's doing the wrong things for the right reason. Right. I had to headcanon the fact that maybe those heads on spikes were, uh, uh, known criminals or, you know, people mm-hmm. who were, you know, doing something. No, like he it. did random. <laughs> he definitely did random. Yeah. <laughs> nope. That was, that was Papa who didn't come home from church that day. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, but that makes him, I think that makes him a more interesting character, right? Is that he mm-hmm, will use yeah. fear as a as a ruling tactic. He will be cruel when he thinks that it helps his ends. And he's not this good guy, hero, savior of Japan. Maybe the ends, you know, were great. Like he, he made this era of peace, this long era where Je- Japan went through a lot of positive changes. But at what cost, right? And, and is that cost right. justified? Then again, how many lives did he save by avoiding open war? Mm-hmm. And the and the devastation that would have rolled on for decades yeah. after that, the, and the and the reconstruction of that. And I think that's a you know to to swing back around to the the larger Toronaga question. I think that's the interesting thing is is that real history is messy and full of compromises and. Mm-hmm. half developed policies and intentions whereas in our fictional worlds we can resolve things neatly and nicely and it, it's it's very simple in a, in a lot of ways and i think this show had the courage to take on the historical nu- nuances of it ain't clean you know, there there are uh, moral compromises that have been made and and uh, you know powerful leaders have to make choices that affect the individual lives of of very small people relative to their power right Hmm. well speaking of smaller people (laughs) this next segment is what i like to call unhinged yabushige and sad boy blackthorn (laughs) (laughs) yabushige is going through it yeah oh that desperate moment on the boat was (laughs) it was just it was a comic relief but also just devastating at the same time just yeah yeah humor dipped in darkness oh boy i thought it was interesting that they decided to play yabashige too as having a little you know traumatic brain injury post uh explosion when he's chasing the carp and stuff i didn't know 
exactly what that was doing for me for the story. It, it was definitely an interesting choice, and I, I don't know if it was making him more vulnerable. It was sort of because in the last episode nine, they even show him cowering in fear when they're holed up in the storehouse, and after the explosion, you know, he's he's really taken down a few pegs. Yeah, mm-hmm. and and maybe the jump, you know, being concussed and. I, I had a, a a friend once who, who who had a concussion, and for a good twelve hours, they he was just trapped in this loop of always asking what time it was and look having to look at a newspaper to, you know, to, we just got a newspaper because like show him the date because we got tired of uh, it was my roommate at the time, and it was uh, it was really weird because it was like he was literally a broken record. He was just stuck in this groove, mm-hmm. uh, and so I don't know if that's what they were going for. I I, I wasn't quite sure. Uh, with, with the whole crazy man Yabushige. Yeah, I thought it was just a mental break. But I have to admit that a big part of me was like, Blackthorn, just go, go with him and let's do a season two <laughs> Yabushige <laughs> Takes England. <Yeah. laughs> Coming to England, starring, yeah. <laughs> starring Eddie Murphy. Well, they had, they would have to get uh, Rodriguez, though, right? They, yeah, they absolutely. Oh, yeah. I was disappointed he didn't show back up. I you know, know. Just to give I know. Blackthorn his boyfriend back. <laughs> yeah, you know, and and I love Ishido coming up to Yabashige and talking to him and being like, I have the worst fucking vassals. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he Ishido is obviously very concerned about Yabashige's madness, right? So like, mm-hmm. I, I wonder, honestly, I think if if this were reversed and Yabashige had been, you know, hired by Toronaga to do something shady like this. I think that Toronaga would have killed him right there or had him killed in some way. And I think yeah, Ishido but, is just not as calculating as Toronaga. But would Toronaga have him do something like kidnap someone like that? Because his way is more like, let's do it publicly and shame them. No, you're right. He would never have gotten to that point. Let's call people out. Yeah. yeah. But you know what I mean? Is like Toronaga mm-hmm. would not have allowed a loose end to go sail off. Right. Right. Yeah, and there were, uh, sloppy. there were no loose ends in Yabushige's uh, <laughs> final moments. <laughs> that was a, a clean and convincing <laughs> resolve for, yeah. for Yabushige. I really did like the opportunity for Toronaga and Yabushige to have a final moment together. And, and it was a great, it, it worked well as an exposition dump at the same time. Right. To, to right. clear up anything, but it, it, mm-hmm. it was a beautiful way to do it and i appreciate it but i just love the fact there were there was even a small part of me that was hoping that toranaga would pardon him and it's like oh don't worry about it you know it's all good and i'll, I'll make you uh I'll make you a minor lord again and and we'll we'll get some we'll do some we'll have some fun again we'll, we'll get some stuff right. done. but uh but nope <laughs> and it was it was um it was it really and resolved that whole storyline in such a, a great yeah. way. It was yeah. a very satisfying storytelling moment. It was. Yeah, I was glad that I was glad that Yabushige was lucid and in the end, uh, you know, that Agreed. he went out very much himself. Um, but I did also question when Toronaga said to him, you know, I keep jo- John Blackthorn around because he makes me laugh. And I wondered if in some way Blackthorn had replaced Yab- Yabushige oh. in Toronaga's. No. <laughs> well, you know, we, we often misuse the term foil in fiction mm-hmm. foil really is a character who is stagnant who is static while the other character grows the other character that starts in a similar place grows and That's interesting i didn't realize that that was the more truer yeah. literary uh, yeah yeah definition of it we constantly misuse it and use it as like just a contrast character uh yeah but in whatever i don't care about the misuse but this is a true foil <laughs> i would say is yabashige and blackthorn start off very much as two people for themselves. Yabashige stays that way. Blackthorn finally becomes something bigger. Right. That's a really good point. And, and, and to the point that Yabashige can't, can't even see the plan. Like he's sitting there going, Lord, I don't see it. Like what was Crimson Sky? How did it work? I, you know, da, da, da. And, and he, he, didn't, he didn't have that insight. He, he didn't grow. 
he was stuck in his his flat dimensional thinking. Uh, so that's a really good point. That's really interesting. And it's also interesting that um, that Blackthorn. So I guess they changed it from the book in the previous show, where Blackthorn tries to commit seppuku much earlier in the story. Yes, and yes, yes. I'm glad that they held this for this, you know, this last moment where Blackthorn is yelling, I was using you. I was using you. I'm the enemy. And it's like Blackthorn still doesn't realize that Tornog is using him and it plans to for the rest of his life. <laughs> also, <laughs> was an enemy one of the first words that he learned? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Again, those little rhyming couplets from the beginning to the end here. Mm. It was really well done. Yeah, that was a, that was really interesting because Tornaga says, "If you are quite finished, right? You know, would you please, yep. if you don't mind, you know, building me a fleet? You know, if in your spare time after you finished sob, you were telling me your sob story and how you were using me. <laughs> it's just he's so much more powerful and bigger sighted than Blackthorn ever was or ever could be." Um, right. in that. So even though Blackthorn has this tremendous amount of growth relative to him, he's still just a piece in this larger puzzle. Yeah. Well, we're jumping ahead a little bit. We still have other things to talk about with Blackthorn. How about <laughs> the season, the scene rather, not the season, the scene where Alvito is basically like, look, you were gonna die here, but Marco saved you. And then he just weeps. Hmm. Yeah. What's I the thought, last? Yeah. Yeah, I was just gonna say, you know, we leading into the season, like, huh, is is Cosmo Jarvis gonna can he pull this? I, I thought characterization all the way through this final episode really was quite spot on. And and he has this big puppy dog, dumb puppy dog energy uh, about him. But it just it played and, and his his uh, ability to to spar with Alvito, but while still being changed, and to see the oh, is this where I die? It, it, it just it balanced so perfectly um, the the energy that Blackthorn has got to be experiencing in that moment. Is this where I die? This is it. How many times has he been on this precipice of of almost dying? Yep. And you know, yep. if, you know, if, if, am I fine? Have the have the Catholics and the uh, the Portuguese finally got my number, and nope, Marico saves him. That 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 was an amazing turn. Yeah, yeah. Well, he he did the uh, the grand romantic gesture of volunteering to be her second, and this is kind of her grand romantic gesture in return. He offers yeah, her death, her one. final gift, and she offers him life. Oh, Aww. boom! There it is. There it is. All right. Well, it. Something that was in the, I want to hark back to episode nine, which I didn't realize until I watched, I was able to finish a, a second watch, was that scene where um, after Ashido gives them the pass, you know, to leave, the way that they framed that shot and the way that they were, uh, Mariko and Blackthorn were holding hands together, that was a wedding. Mm. They were married spiritually in that moment. And in that, and then, as you say, in that whole thing of in life and in death, and that's what she says to him at some point, right? Or he even says, fuck it, you know, we live and we die, right? You know, that's it, their whole relationship is in that sort of Mobius loop of, you know, of life and death and, and twisted in that way. It's, it's really brilliant. I guess Blackthorn and Buntaro are, are brother husbands now. Maybe, <laughs> maybe they're married at the end. <laughs> They're just we're just gonna have a big fest with uh, Rodriguez, Butaro. <laughs> yeah. Yabushige. It's yeah, for the boys. You know. It's for the boys. Dream blunt rotation. <laughs> All right. That's a good note to take a break on. All right, we'll see you right after the break. Hey listeners, Aaron here. If you're watching Fallout on Amazon Prime Video, then we have just the podcast for you. Radioactive Ramblings has joined the Lorehounds Network. We are going to be breaking down the show episode by episode, making far-fetched theories, and dropping some tidbits of lore. If you want to hear us ramble, tune into Radioactive Ramblings, linked in the show notes. We hope to have you join us in the wasteland.
And we're back. David, I hear that you also have to make a departure. My my ship is sailing. I gotta go uh gotta go chase down the, the black ship and uh reap some riches and rewards. R- R- Rodriguez is waiting for me, so I'm gonna I'm gonna bail. What's the uh, name of your want... country? Where are you going? <laughs> <laughs> Take me with you. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to say, uh, Alicia and John, I'm glad the three of us were finally able to podcast together <laughs> yeah. about this <laughs> show. I know we've been sort of, uh, just like Blackthorn, Mariko, and, and Toronaga, we've all been sort of orbiting in our, our ways, but it's been really fun. I'm really glad we were able to cover this, and obviously we'll talk more about the, the season, but I just wanted to mark the moment that all three of us were uh, on the podcast together. It's a magnificent so. day. It's happened. We'll write poetry about <laughs> it. It happened. Yeah. That's right. Anyway, I will uh, catch you guys on the uh, season finale and looking forward to reading everybody's feedback. So send it in because we want to hear from you. But otherwise, I will talk to you guys later. All right. See you soon. All right. I. So now that David has left us, it's time for the segment coming to Ajiro. <laughs> and uh, we are going to Ajiro. I think that's how you're supposed to say it with the, with the Ajiro. Uh, yeah. Yabashige is begging Blackthorn to take him to England, but they, of course, see Erasmus is destroyed and the village is being tortured to find the culprit because Toranaga is just a swell guy. Mm-hmm. And uh, we kind of talked about that already, but, yeah. you know, Yabashige is brought before Toranaga, accused of treason and sentenced to commit seppuku. He asks for Blackthorn a second. Yeah, interesting. But he gets Toranaga his second second. <laughs> Which, you know, I would think he would rather have, uh, just in terms of skill with the sword, I would rather have oh, Toranaga yeah. personally. Well, it did take Toranaga nine hacks. When he <laughs> was a teenager, <laughs> yeah, but I they know. don't know that. That's the thing, is only yeah, Hiromatsu yeah. knew that. Right. Right. The legend uh, is that he strike. did it. Mm-hmm. Of course. Right, right. <laughs> now, Omi. Omi is the one who sold out Yabashige. We haven't really talked yeah. about him yet this episode. I'm not what do you surprised. think about that? I'm not surprised. Um, I think it's it's kind of heartbreaking, and like he's even heartbroken himself about it at the end. He's like, well, you, you still called me your, named me your uh, heir. And yeah. yeah, we get to see one more Yabushige uh, <laughs> will writing <laughs> one last time for the road. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so Omi, it's interesting because in the book, he's a lot more like ruthless. He okay. knows that Yabushige is the one in between him and higher status. And he's basically like, how do I get this guy to dig his own grave? Mm-hmm. In this, he doesn't that, yeah. even have to do that. Yabushige just does it. Yeah. <laughs> But we see a little bit where, you know, he's you can tell that he was happy being, you know, the head of this of this province and running it basically mm-hmm. himself. And he had his his mistress and, you know, life was good. Yeah, for he had him. his Kiku. Mm hmm. Exactly. He had his Kiku. He had plenty of cuckoos. And <laughs> he was having a great time. Yeah. And, and life was good for him. And then his uncle comes back in and messes it all up. And of course. Most of it, it's actually Toranaga's fault, but I can see why he he was always kind of looking side eye at his uncle, and then he sees an opportunity for personal advancement. Right, right. Well, someone else is back in Ajiro. Fuji, of course, mm-hmm. has been taking care of Blackthorn's home that he hasn't been to seemingly in months. Mm-hmm. Her last I guess act. it's been it's been six months, right? It's because Concord. she's been relieved of her service. Right. I guess yeah, six months in total. Yeah, yeah. They have no translator, and and like, I love that they use the lack of a translator to sort of emphasize the hole that Mariko left behind. Right. Yeah, I, I loved just the quiet moment there because it's true they didn't have anyone to translate their literal words but they also didn't need at that moment they knew that they were both feeling the same thing right and they just look at where she would be sitting and she was totally totally in the know about the way that marco and blackthorn felt about each other i mean she literally lived in the same house (laughs) yeah yeah three's company too (laughs) Yeah, no, I I think um, 
they were really created a nice little family there for a moment. You know, it's only six months maximum to, minus time traveling to Osaka. But they that was probably for those who live, that's going to be a period that they think back on forever. Yeah, for sure. What do you think about her keeping her family's ashes against custom? Well, I feel like I was one of the people, um, a, a few people express this on the Discord who was kind of at first like, are they being disrespectful with uh, the way they dispose of the ashes? Uh, disrespectful to Japanese customs? But then it was such a beautiful moment, I didn't care. And actually, when you when you put it this way, that she's already keeping the ashes against custom, it's like, well, why not just go a different way with it? She obviously right. wasn't feeling good about what she thought she was supposed to do with them. So let's do something that gives her peace. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting thing. You know, we, we say, are they being disrespectful to Japanese custom? But Fuji is an individual. And does mm -hmm. she want to follow Japanese custom, right? I mean, not all of us who were raised Catholic stay Catholic. And, right. uh, you know, all, all these different aspects of making her a multi-layered character, I think, I think really add to the realism of the show. Absolutely. I mean, that's, that's been, that's what's so remarkable about the show is that every character has all these layers, all these, they really built out what is the three hearts of each character and, and show them in conflict with, with each other, with themselves. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting because says Fuji is a really minor character in the book and she's still pretty minor in the show, but she feels so much bigger than her screen time. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, it's touching uh, Nate, uh, our resident historian. He was sharing a Japanese uh, article about the actress and that she's kind of overwhelmed by all the attention and love that her character is getting and all the memes. <laughs> oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's so nice. But yeah, I mean, I, I think that. I, I, I think that I see where people are coming from on are they disrespecting Japanese customs, but. I don't know. I think the character moment works, like you said, and and I don't know if we need to have Fuji want to follow the Japanese custom. Like maybe no. maybe that was really meaningful for her. She was in a weird situation to begin with, right? She mm -hmm. was recently widowed and childless, and she is sent to become the consort of a newly minted foreign samurai who didn't even speak her language, and then that guy has an affair with one of her buddies. <laughs> and it's just such a weird situation overall. And, and I think that her situation is so different and out of the norm for what she was raised to do that I wouldn't blame her for wanting to try something new. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we get to finally see her have the ability to say no and take some control of her own fate. Right. Yeah, I, I want to talk about that, too. Blackthorn, is he just like, I need somebody I know? <laughs> I think so. I mean, yeah, he's lost. He's lost so much in such a short time. Um, right. Well, especially with Monaco. But yeah, I can imagine he feels especially isolated now. He has to bond with Buntaro of all people. <laughs> They're besties. I want a sitcom. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> a buddy comedy. <laughs> Buntaro and Blackthorn as roommates. <laughs> yeah. They're just going, uh, you know, uh, get horsing around the land, taking care of petty crime in different <laughs> villages in their province. Yeah. And, and Blackthorn is just there to fling English or Portuguese curses at people and not right. have them know what he's saying. <laughs> Don't translate that. I love that. <laughs> when he said that yeah. to uh, yeah. when the samurai out himself. That was really good later. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and and she does help Blackthorn. Fuji helps Blackthorn set up the meeting with Toronaga, right? Mm -hmm. and one, I wonder how how did she translate that? <laughs> how did she translate? <laughs> I for thought him? about or did that. Did she too. just kind of you know write a message? But yeah, this this is a little confusing to me. Is how did he prepare his statement? Oh, how did he learn what he wanted to yeah. say? Yeah, yeah. He's that's like, I prepared true. a statement. How did he do that? Like, it would make sense if Mariko was still there. Or if he knew that he could go to Moranji. Right. But how did he get, obviously he must have turned to Fuji, but how would he, uh, how would she know what he was trying to say? Yeah. Good question. Little plot Maybe hole. He, 
Maybe he drew pictograms. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Maybe I, I, I want a full scene. I want like a 10 minute scene of him just miming to her what he wants to say. Yeah. And her like making facial expressions reacting to his dancing. Or finding out that actually he was intending to say something completely different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. Blackthorn and Toronaga, sort of the, I would say, the character development climax of this series. Because, you know, we we spent a lot of time. The book is really the Blackthorn story. Mm-hmm. The show, I would say, is more of the Toronaga Mariko story. Right. And this episode kind of brought us back to the Blackthorn story to bring it full circle. He kind of came back out of the background. And this felt like finally the climax of his arc. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think they they pace that out well. And again, haven't read the book, but it seems like the changes that they've made um, seem they the way they're described to me, at least, I think that they were smart changes, especially yeah. in this regard. They definitely do the the attempted seppuku too early in the book because it makes an emotional climax happen really early. Mm-hmm. And then can you just do it again at the end and have it have the same impact? I think it has more of an impact if this is the first time. Right. Especially because he's been so like, oh, this culture that you know just kills my gardener for throwing away my rotting pheasant right right also full circle yeah i want to talk about where there's been a lot of chatter in the discord about overuse of the word seppuku okay and it seems like people are upset and and i could be misunderstanding but i think people are upset that people are that that viewers are using the word seppuku with what blackthorn was doing but was it, I mean, was it not because he held, he was going to gut himself, right? But he didn't have, yeah. he didn't yeah. even name a second. I was like, what are you doing, dude? I think to me, it's not traditional seppuku. Right. But I, I would say he is trying to do it. He's right. It, in his limited understanding of it, it is attempted seppuku. Mm-hmm. Because that's he's, his, he's, that's his, um, that's what, yeah, indeed. That's his, uh, what he's, his goal. His, yeah. I mean, he's seen it done. He's mm-hmm. seen Marco prepare and he's like, I'm going to do the same things. He's going to lay his dagger down in front of him. Uh, and so I, I do think that he was trying to mimic what he saw. But also the way Marco was doing it, it was apparently not the way that women typically did it. And the character Mariko was based on did end her life in that way, or she was killed by her servants. Right. Yeah. That's, that's like a whole thing too. We don't have time for that kind of worm. <laughs> but yeah, I, I mean, I, I understand the whole idea of like, let's not call all suicide seppuku. Mm-hmm. I do think that Blackthorn was at least trying to. Yeah. It was his intention. Play sure. seppuku. Yeah. Yeah. And he was going to do it. I really do think if Toronaga had not stopped him there, he would have done it. But the fact he didn't even name a second shows how this is a character who doesn't think all the steps ahead like Toronaga does, for instance. Right. It's almost like when he speaks Japanese, does he speak Japanese? Like, can we say he's speaking Japanese if he's speaking broken Japanese? I think so. He's just doing it poorly. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I think as long as it's. When it's broken Japanese and it's his own thoughts, then it is. It reminds me of there's a lot of discussion um, in the psychology community over whether animals, for instance, great apes, are able to learn, for instance, sign language. Mm-hmm. And um, and then the question becomes, are they actually signing things of out of their own thoughts or have they just learned to mimic those around them? Um, Maybe we I should think- ask them. <laughs> well, exactly. I mean, I think yeah, there's there's compelling arguments to both sides for that in the animal um, case, but in this case, I, I think the question comes down to the same. Especially considering they had Blackthorn, and they show he's gifted with European languages. Of course, Japanese is going to be a completely different linguistic beast. But yeah. how much does he know by the end? Like, for instance, 
when in episode nine, when they were in Osaka and he and Yabushige are trying to communicate to each other, how much actual understanding was there of between them and of what he was acting out in court or, you know, versus just mimicking to get through this experience? Hanto? Hanto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I I agree with that. I think that that's, that's a good... It's a good distinction there that you've made. So another aspect to this whole scene is Miraji being a secret samurai who speaks fluent Portuguese and has just been like the master of everything the whole time. Right. Right. Which we had a glimpse of as an audience, but I guess I didn't think about the fact that he might secretly speak Portuguese. Yeah. Well, he did. He did help him a little bit, right? Like he knew a few phrases. Mm hmm. But he was pretending to be he was pretending to be like not that great at it. Right. Right. But to we yeah, we bit. knew he was a samurai, but we didn't know that he also had linguistic skills. Right. So it is interesting. I mean, I guess obviously Tornaga wanted to keep his role and his background uh, secrets so that he could be the little spy in the village. But um, it's interesting that Tornaga asked Marco to be the translator, the interpreter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's also the whole scene where Toronaga and Blackthorn are arguing and through Miraji, but Blackthorn just starts speaking in, I think English, maybe Portuguese. And he's just yelling at him. He's just like, I'm feeding you shit. I fed you shit. Yeah. And, and he's mimicking it too. He's miming it. Yeah. Uh, and, and he yeah. just kind of is just like, I'm going to make you understand without any kind of barrier. I'm going to look you in the eye. Mm -hmm. And that felt like an important moment for him, too. Yeah, see, I would I wish I knew which whether he was speaking English or Portuguese in that moment, because to me, that communicates different things. Like if he's speaking English, it's really just him going to his most unhinged, emotional id place. And if he's right. speaking Portuguese, he's still expecting you know, the, the interpreter present to understand this and be able to repeat it back later. Right. So that's one of the cases where I'm like, it, it was just a little sloppy the way that European languages were handled, which is so unlike you. the rest I of the show. To me, it was few and far between. I mean, there, I think the problem is if you introduce speaking different languages at different times, then you have to address, are you going to have Marco and Blackthorn speak Latin at certain times? Because that's something that happens in the books. Yeah. Well, I can understand dropping Portuguese. Latin. Yeah. Yeah. There's just like a lot of a lot of tricky moments, I think. You know, are you going to have Blackthorn now speak Dutch when he speaks to his crewmates? Yes, yes I very much want to hear Cosmo Jarvis speak Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think Cosmo Jarvis wants to hear Cosmo Jarvis speak Dutch. That's the problem. I mean, but that's the thing is he is an Englishman, so it would he's supposed to have an accent when he speaks these oh, other true, languages. True. It's not like he's supposed to sound like a native. Right. But anyway, I'll stop harping on that. No, fair enough. And I, I think the show made certain decisions at different points. Like I mentioned, when you have Father Alvito talking to Toronaga, and Toronaga's like, he's not worthy to speak our tongue. I'm like, okay, they definitely just wanted this actor be, to be able to full act and not think mm -hmm. about language in the scene. Like, that's yeah. why they did that. <laughs> no, it's true. It's true. And and yeah. I do like the Cosmo, Cosmo Jarvis casting. Um, I don't know how good he is personally with languages. Yeah, maybe maybe they handed him a script with some Portuguese in it, and they were like, yeah, we can't do this. <laughs> <laughs> we love you as Blackthorn, but we're not making you speak Portuguese. Yeah, that's fair. I don't know. I, I, used to do, I used to do a lot of singing in, like, choirs and jazz stuff, and I, I had this jazz piece I had to sing once called Bananera, and it was Portuguese. Mm -hmm. And I was just like, why do none of the syllables look like they sound? <laughs> It's so different from Spanish and the pronunciation. It and is. I, it is. I understand why. Like Portuguese is a hard language to learn if you speak yeah. English. Yeah, and no, I I used to date a guy named João, and then, and I'm still I'm sure the Portuguese speakers are cringing, but he was constantly trying to get me to say the vowel right. But they have some interesting sounds. Yeah. So Blackthorn has given up his Western ambitions, right? Mm -hmm. I would say. Uh, which is funny because later Toronaga mentions his whole idea of like, oh, your war is stupid. Your war is small unless I win. Right. Right. 
And so Toronaga, I think, believes in Blackthorns of War more than he does now. Yeah, I mean, I think Blackthorn is still an individualist in the end. And if it's like, okay, here's here are your options. You can go chasing glory back in, you know, Europe and maybe with your ties to Japan or whatever. But um, that's going to be a fraught life full of battles. And and this life, yeah, there there's going to be some battles, but you're already in a comfortable position. Um, you're already... You live in a beautiful place. Uh, you're just going to build ships for the rest of your days, basically. Like, I can see why why leave that life And to yeah, go yeah, back I mean, to he, war. He's got it made, right? Like, he has a mm-hmm. great salary. He's got a fief. He's got, you know, he, he has servants for everything. I mean, he's living yeah. a life of luxury, really. Like, in, in England, he probably never would have reached this level of, of riches. And these are this is early days in the Eighty Years' War as well, so I can imagine maybe things looked a little hopeless because this war, as the name implies, went on for eighty freaking years. So, yeah. And can we just pour one out for Blackthorn's European family, though, because they are yeah. just screwed <laughs> at this point. The, I mean, they're. I hope that he. I hope that they are well enough off from his. He was obviously not from the poorest of positions, considering his position on the boat when they arrived. Mm -hmm. So I hope they're well enough off. She gets to declare herself a widow and live life on her own terms, as often widows were only able to do. Well, I'm not sure that I believe in 16th, 17th century public welfare. Um, (laughs) I don't don't know if that was a thing, uh, but let's hope that the public was good to them. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm hoping that they just had enough uh, money, family money, things like that. Yeah. And that yeah. this gives her a little more freedom to find someone who's not going to keep running away to anyone else but your family life. <laughs> yeah. It's it's funny. Like he in the book, he has a lot of internal monologue where he's like, how am I going to go back to my smelly wife? You know, mm-hmm. like I like everybody smells back there. Mm-hmm. How am I going to go back there? Everyone's so filthy. I, I think he even thinks he's like, could I convince her to start Dude. bathing like the Japanese? <laughs> <laughs> it's just funny. All right. So let's go to Yabashige Seppuku. And I and I noticed David loves to talk about his rhyming couplets. But there was a big rhyming couplet here, which is that in episode three in the opening, Yabashige is writing his will. And he thinks he's going to die because Toronaga gives him this beautiful sunrise, right? He invites him up to see the sunrise. And he's like, thanks for the sunrise. Let's get on with it. Mm. Now it's sunset and he's going to die with Toronaga. Right. Right. I mean, and it's funny because that was the end of the, I mean, that was the sunrise was at the beginning of what we see of their story together. And the sunset is the close of it. Right. Right. Yeah. I think that's pretty beautiful. Yeah, I love um I love just the fact that he is most himself in this moment here too, you know, with his his whole his crappy poem and cockiness about it as you wrote here. Um but also when he looks back over his shoulder at the last moment like you're not really going to do it, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he sure does do it. Yeah. Yeah. Yabashige is not making it out of there. Mm-mm. He needs to know what's coming next, though. He's like, fine, kill me. But before I die, can you just tell me what's coming next? I would. And Toronaga does it. The only thing he denies him is a confirmation of his secret heart. Right. Right. I mean, I can imagine from Toronaga's perspective, like he's lost pretty much anyone he can speak to openly. And this is his last chance to just to gloat a little bit like I did the thing. Look, I did the thing. I can't. I can't uh, be this open about it with anyone else. So why not you? Because I know you're not going to tell anyone. Yeah. And and so in the book, this is an internal monologue. This is, this is, you know, his, his thoughts. This is Torganaga's thoughts. So I thought this was a really brilliant way to allow an exposition dump that made sense. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, great idea. Great idea. Tell it to a dying man. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, I, I have in, in apparently so Yabushige he's based on the real life Honda Masanobu and in the real life this Masanobu Honda he basically died of alcoholism you know uh, he just drank himself to death 
because of his guilt and whatever over his mm. maneuvering. Do you, I think that this is a more satisfying end. What do you think? For That's sure. kind of the alcoholism death is, is more tragic, even sadder. Yeah, it is. It is. There's actually, that's interesting you say that because in the book, there's an early scene where I think Miraji is massaging Yabashige, who's like Yabu in the book, mm -hmm. but he feels his, he feels his liver. He's like, oh, those kidneys and the liver are shot. Like he's going to be de dead in a few years. Like he could feel like mm -hmm. alcohol sickness basically. I wonder if that's, you know, David was asking about his break and the chasing the carp in the pond. I wonder if he was just just drinking himself too hard at that moment. Yeah. Also, cirrhosis can cause, um, you know, hallucinations and whatnot. Right. Okay. That but, makes sense. Yeah. All right. So uh, we've got a couple more things to talk about. I just want to talk about Toronaga's plan. I mean, we talked about the real history, but was there a backup plan if Ochiba did not bail him out. Hmm. You mean because it got to the, uh, because it got to the battlefield before. Yeah. Yeah. Like, was there a backup plan? Well, I don't think he would have ever let it get to the battlefield. Right. But, you know, Toronaga clearly has a plan at the beginning of the episode before he ever gets Ochiba's letter. But mm -hmm. I think this was plan a was convince Ochiba to ally. But what was plan B is my question. I mean, I think his maneuver with Mariko in Osaka was just to get as many people as possible to want to jump ship and be on his side because yeah. they were afraid of Ishido um, caging them, basically, of, of yeah. them being They were like, this guy straight up sucks, Ishido. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Toronaga makes himself look like the better person also because people are upset about Mariko. Yeah. And he knew that. He was willing to sacrifice her knowing the effect that it would have on people. Especially, I mean, this this is just something that happens maybe not with his plan, but the way that she delivers such a beautiful poem in front of all the nobles and, you know, like the day before she dies. <laughs> right. And it's uh it's really sad and I think people are really like this is this is a a young woman who should have had a long life ahead of her and now she's gone. All because Ishido failed to keep a safe realm. But I guess she was also quite famous. So it's like, in a way, if there was a saintly Lady Gaga who suddenly got <laughs> killed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so Toronaga absolutely wanted to be Shogun the whole time, right? Yes. I, I think he almost admits as much to Yabushige. Yeah. And, and the whole time he's like, oh, I don't want to be Shogun. No, yeah. no, no. Liar, and I liar, think it's actually kimono on fire. <laughs> it's honestly so. I actually tried to do some research on this, and I couldn't find anything. But in Western culture, the reluctant leader, the reluctant hero, is such a trope. You know, going back as far as Moses, right? You know, not wanting to to lead the Hebrews out of Egypt. And I was trying to find if this was a similar trope in eastern cultures especially Jap japan mm -hmm. but i couldn't find a single reference and i and i looked everywhere on the internet i spent like an hour looking for stuff and i couldn't find anything so if anyone has any thoughts on that maybe i'll ask nate next week but i i'm really curious because torinaga publicly is the reluctant leader but right. he's not in his secret heart and right. that's what makes him i think a more interesting character than we're used to absolutely yeah, because this is this is a more realistic, but also we learn that Toranaga understands the power of of legend of stories being presented in certain ways, like in right. the beheading of his youth. Right, right. So he's got visions of an era of peace. He's just taken away Ishido's allies and made him lose before the first battle. Yeah, I mean, what a what a crazy. Like, what a crazy plan that worked. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's convenient. Uh, a lot of elements like that in the story are convenient, but I don't mind it because it just, it's 
So it's like, you know, com- he's not controlling the wind, but he's composing the music that he makes all the uh, different players dance to. Yeah. He's certainly, like I said, he's certainly redirecting it in certain points. Right. And he kept Blackthorn because he made him laugh. But I think by the end, he definitely learned from him. Mm-hmm. You know, th- I think that so. whole quote of the battle doesn't matter un- unless I win. I mean, he basically had everybody was telling him the whole time. This is a hopeless battle against Ishido and the regents. And he's like, unless I win. And he did win. Yeah. But it's also funny because it's kind of like the um the whole pheasant thing with the, you know, letting it rot and letting the maggots uh-huh. eat away and tenderize the meat. That's basically was how um Toronaga handled this entire situation. So he was like, How do I let this regency rot from within and send right. in little maggots like Marco? Not to ever call her a maggot, but you know what I mean? To nibble <laughs> to nibble at the flesh and soften it up so that it just sloughs off itself. Right. I sent a woman to do what an army never could. Right. Genius. And the whole time, I I love the way the show subverted our expectations. Because the whole time we're like, oh, we're going to use cannons. And we're going to storm Osaka. And it's going to be an amazing battle. And we're thinking Crimson Sky is the name of the episode. I remember I listened to your podcast with David on episode eight. Mm -hmm. And... (laughs) And yeah, we podcast, were expecting. You guys yeah. were like, oh, next episode's Crimson Sky. It's going to be <laughs> a crazy gonna... battle. But and, it was a crazy uh, was... battle. Yeah. Just not yeah. the way we expected. Not with yeah. armies, but with Mariko and her attendance and power of the wills. The way that, and I don't want to relitigate the whole episode nine, but the way that Anna Sawai raises her voice to a higher pitch that's so cutting, it feels mm. like a knife being driven into Ishido. And it, yeah. it was just such a good episode. I think that's that's the episode of the season. I think so, too. I agree. Um, I think that the this finale was perfect in wrapping things up in, in, a, in a way that felt natural and appropriate and tied all the pieces together and gave a satisfying ending. But it is still the denouement. Yeah. So will... Toronaga keep destroying Blackthorn ships. Do we think that's going to happen? Because he's like, maybe I'll have to destroy it again. I mean, I think at some point it might be handy for him to have a fleet of his own. He might, that might be something that he would actually like to have. Oh, no, we definitely need a fire department over here, Blackthorn. I'm really sorry your your third ship got burned down. (laughs) Yeah, it's just the lightning here is crazy. Yeah. All right, so getting the ship. This was a a fun little way to end the episode. Uh, Directing everyone with the help of Muraji, but I think he's he's speaking better Japanese now than he has been. Yeah, finally, yeah. Uh, You brought up the don't translate that when he's cursing (laughs) at them. (laughs) Yeah, uh, which I guess means that he's cursing in Portuguese. You would think he'd be cursing in English. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Maybe it's just like he doesn't want to switch back and forth so often. Right. Maybe. I mean, maybe he likes that. He's like, okay, Miraji, you and I have this uh, special bond where you get my jokes because nobody yeah. else does. <laughs> um. So he can't get the ship out until Buntaro joins his new right. bestie. Why, why is Buntaro the guy who can just pull a ship out. I feel like nobody else even needed to be on the ropes, right? Like Bundaro was would have just walked up and been like, "Yeah, I got this." <laughs> he's he's a samurai of legend. What can I say? <laughs> yeah. I can't believe that this guy survived the season. Yeah, I was kind of surprised by that too. And I was surprised that he landed in a relatively I mean, he's been taken down so many pegs, especially with yeah. Uh, yeah. with with Marco and his father and everything, but um he landed in a surprisingly okay place. Like he can just live his life. Uh, he's got legendary status. He could definitely marry again as he wants. Yeah. Well, and also his son is of the Akechi line. Right. And, and I think that will, that will give him some good status too. Cause that was a really Although, high line. Yeah. His son was completely brainwashed by the Ishido cult. I wonder if, he I wonder what their relationship is, if anything, after this. 
I, I don't think that Bruntero has spent a day parenting. <laughs> no. I don't think he I think he's probably said ten words to that kid. Yeah. But he's still gonna give him all of his land and titles or whatever. Yeah. They'll talk when, when he's an adult, right? Like that's that seems to be the Bunduro style of parenting is yeah, I'll talk to my kids when they're adults. Yeah. 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 Um and Blackthorn, of course, shares one more look with Toronaga before we cut to black. Yeah. It's really the love story between the two of them. No, no, no. And it's Japan. Rodriguez. <laughs> I Rodriguez know. and Blackthorn. I know. Where was Rodriguez? As soon as when they were like, oh, look, the ship is back. It was that in episode nine. Uh, I, I was really hoping Rodriguez was going to be on board. Does he come back at the end in the book? I didn't finish the book. Okay. <laughs> I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I did read the wiki of what happens at the end of the book because I just wanted to make sure that like right. I knew some of the differences. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I didn't look it up until after I watched the final episode because I didn't want that okay. spoiled for me. Right. All right, so let's talk about our favorite moments before we head out of here. You want to do the first one? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I guess it was just uh, Yavu writing his final will and then dying the way that he lived, you know, that that look back over the shoulder, like I said, in his kick-ass poem, going to get it tattooed. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. My my first one was him, you know, Yabushige is great. Just Yabushige shouting, teach me to dive. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just unhinged. Desperation. Unhinged. Oh, pure desperation. Yeah. And it's amazing that he comes back from that and then is so, you know, he he does his duty, quote unquote. He's composed in the end. He goes through with it. Yeah. He does. Yeah. He does. He, I think he, he understands. He's like, all right, I, I played the Game of Thrones and I lost. So I die. Right. Right. I yeah. mean, he I think he he's obviously always thinking about his legacy with that rewriting of the will all the time. And he wants to go out with honor. Yep. What was your second favorite moment? Um. Yeah, it was definitely realizing that the Blackthorn flashback was not actually how his story was going to end, because that was to me just kind of like going to be the most depressing part of all. <laughs> yeah. With yeah, his, yeah, the, those little English brats calling the people we've fallen in love with savages. It was like, oh, oh, no. <laughs> yeah, it, I was thinking, like, did he not raise his kids better uh, I know. to raise well, their kids he, better? Yeah, did he raise his kids at all or was he just in Japan? <laughs> oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Do you think he starts another family? Does he, does he get another family in Japan or does he ever sail his family over? I highly doubt that he would ever sail his family over because first he would have to disinfect his wife and children. Um, (laughs) Just hose them down when they get there. But I think in, yeah, I could see in the story him, yeah, settling down because I think it would also, if he's keeping this status as a nobleman, it's probably somewhat expected of him. Right. Right. Yeah, Um, and... uh, what was your second? Mine was Blackthorn starting to just break down in tears when he learns that Mariko saved him. And mm. and just this mutual respect between him and Alvito. You know, the kind of this whole scene where, you know, he goes, I didn't, you know, I prayed to God, but not your God or my God, just God. Which feels right. like a really modern sentiment. And, and it did take me out a little bit. But I really liked that sentiment between them because it just felt really emotional. Yeah. Uh, the moment where I got most emotional was when Toronaga uh, was talking about Marco's poetry, and you know he mm-hmm. repeated the line about uh, the her about the her words in the bonfire, and just you know how brightly that bonfire burns because of all these words she left behind. And yeah, and again, that reminded me that this is based on a real person, and the a lot of the poetry, as you said, was actually poetry written by Hosokawa Gracia. So it's, that's just a beautiful thing to remember that uh, this this woman did sacrifice herself in real life. Um, but centuries later, we are still talking about that sacrifice. So it wasn't for nothing, I suppose. Right. Yeah. I mean, she she had an insane influence on Japanese history. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. And your final favorite moment? 
the lack of battles. It's actually the absence of something that was my favorite, which was that there was no big, you know, physical battle in this whole right. season. It was just verbal battles. It was battles of, of character to character. I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. It it felt real and it felt fresh. Right. Absolutely. More focused on the human players rather than the machines of war. Definitely. Well, as we mentioned in the intro, we're going to save all our feedback for the season wrap up podcast, which will be out in about a week. But you can always send that feedback into Shogun at the lorehounds.com or you can go to the lorehounds.com, go to the contact page and you'll be able to leave us a voicemail or a contact form entry. You can also send us a message on Discord, you know, go into the Shogun channel, tag us, say, I want this to be feedback, and we'll include that as well. And Alicia, you'll be back for the season wrap up. Is that right? Absolutely. And in the meantime, you can check out uh, Going Live around the same time as this is the uh, episodes one to three breakdown of Beacon 23 season two on Wool Shift Dust. Nice transition. <laughs> <laughs> So we'll shift us. You're back with Beacon 23. And I'm sorry about doing my impression of you saying that. I know Hugh Howie. But... Like I said, I should stop making that my catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it made David laugh at least. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so you've got a lot going on on your feed. You've got, do you have some Dune stuff going on too? Yeah, well, I mean, it's a... Uh... The Dune stuff is still in the works, although I have to be honest, it's slightly paused because I'm prepping for this uh, to launch the Star Wars Canon Timeline podcast. Right, right. I wasn't sure how much I was allowed to say about that yet, so I was yeah. letting you do it. <laughs> yeah, no, that's going to be uh, kicking off probably uh, in, the, in the next week or so. We're going to put the first episodes live, just a, a little bit of background information leading up to the Acolyte. Cool. And for more science fiction goodness, we have our new feed, Radioactive Ramblings, with Aaron and Chase covering the Fallout show on Amazon. Are you watching Fallout, Alicia? Yes, I've watched the entire season now. It was okay. it was great. Yeah, it's another one of my favorite shows of the year. Awesome. Yeah, I've watched Left the first me less two episodes, devastated. and it's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so they have podcasts out for everything so far. Their full season is uh, is out now. You can listen to it. Uh, and I know they're going to be covering some other stuff soon, but I'm not sure they're concrete plans, so stay posted for that. Yeah, there was whisperings of Invincible and Elden Rings, which both turned my head. A lot of stuff going on on that feed. All right. Um, Rings and Rituals is still going strong. One podcast every two weeks covering season one of the Rings of Power on Prime. They are not just doing a standard breakdown, though. They are looking at it through the lens of Ritual through the bigger Tolkien legendarium and looking at ritual in our daily lives. So, you know, you can, you can check out a bunch of the episodes right now. You may have heard a, uh, a little ad for it at the beginning of this podcast, if you're on the public feed and I hope you'll enjoy it because it's, it's a lovely morning podcast. I think it's great with a cup of coffee or tea. Hmm. I like to, I listen to it. I listen to a lot of podcasts while biking oh. and it's just, uh, yeah, nice to, be able, yeah, it's a calming one. So I look around, I see the canals, and I think about uh, the role ritual plays in my life. Mm. Do you ever see Rebecca's boyfriend in uh, Ted Lasso? Oh, <laughs> did you bike around Amsterdam? <laughs> yeah, I, I pass his boat every day. <laughs> okay, good, good, good. Uh, Properly, Howard is really going strong right now with the season of felonies and fugazis. It's a crime themed season where they are rating a bunch of movies on a scale of better or worse or on par with the average Ron Howard movie, which is just a fun premise. And I always enjoy it, <laughs> but they're doing uh, point break shakedown tango and cash pulp fiction, Gr gross, gross point, point blank, blank and Rocky. Mm. It's really funny. I would, I would recommend you check it out. Even if you're not watching the movies, it's fun to listen. Well, yeah, it's most of those are movies that I watched a long time ago, and then it's fun to get a little reminder. And then some of them are ones I've never heard of, which are kind of often the funniest episodes. Yeah, because they they describe these movies in ways that you're like, "How is this a real movie?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
And of course, stay tuned for our coverage with Properly Howard jointly on Severance whenever that comes out. But it seems like they wrapped filming, so it's going to come out sometime this year. And you and I need to talk about uh, about Doctor Who. And Doctor Who is coming. Some talk of Star Wars uh, catch up. I know. Yeah, we got to. You and I have some scheduling to do, so we're going to do something on the Bad Batch. We're going to do some coverage of Doctor Who, but we got to be really careful about how much we commit to because there's a lot coming in June. Yeah. Uh, on the main Lorehounds feed, we are going to be covering House of the Dragon season one and then season two. So we're going to do two. We're going to do five podcasts, each covering two episodes of season one. And then that will lead right up to season two, where we'll do full coverage of every single episode, just like we did Shogun. Probably even more detailed because we'll probably do a scene by scene recap of it. Cool. And there, uh, I'm working on a show guide. So if you want access to that, subscribe to the Patreon. It'll be, you know, it'll we offered it for Shogun too. It's a character guide. There will be episode guides. We're working on a dragon guide and a geography guide. So we got plenty of plenty of material there. I mean, that world is so full with lore. There's just so much I could put in there. Um, we also are covering the Silmarillion still every month, covering Earthsea until we finish that. Uh, and Silmarillion Stories is now rotating guest show. I think, Alicia, you might be on on a future episode. Yeah, absolutely. And, of course, join us next week for our season wrap-up of Shogun featuring Nate, who you may recognize from the Discord, Nathan Ledbetter, a PhD candidate and member of the East Asian Studies faculty at Princeton. Just absolutely focused on this period. He's uh, the perfect person to talk to about this. Yeah, he's brilliant. He always has such crazy details on the uh, on the Discord, so I can't wait to talk to him in person. All right. Quick thank yous. If you want to access early and ad free episodes, you can go to Supercast or Patreon and subscribe for as little as three bucks a month. You can find all those links in the show notes. And uh, I, like I said, you can get the show guides too for Shogun and House of the Dragon. We did one for True Detective. So we're going strong on those. Our Discord server boosters who help us get a few extra features on the Discord are Opus and the Machine, Gnarls, Aaron K, Tiller the Thriller, Dork of the Ninjas, and Do 71 Thank you to all of you. And our Patreon lore masters are top-tier patrons uh, and Supercast subscribers. I got to start saying that better. Uh, mm -hmm. Who uh, get a shout-out every episode are Samartian, Mark H, Michael G., Michelle E, David W, Brian P, Nick W, SC, Peter O H, Bettina W, Adam S, Nancy M, Duve seventy one, Brian eighty sixty three, Frederick H, Sarah L, Gareth C, Eric F, Matthew M, Sarah M, DJ Miwa, Andra B, Kwang Yu, Dead Eye Jedi Bob, Nathan T, Alex V, Aaron T, Sub Zero, Aaron K, Dally V twenty one. Mothership 61, Gnarls, and Adrian. All right. Thank you, everyone, for all your support, all our patrons, all our listeners. Uh, thank you, Alicia, for being here and subbing for David while he's traveling. Thank you for having me again. See you next week. The Lorehounds Podcast is produced and published by The Lorehounds. You can send questions and feedback and voicemails at thelorehounds.com slash contact. Get early and ad-free access to all Lorehounds podcasts at patreon.com slash the Lorehounds. Any opinions stated are ours personally and do not reflect the opinion of or belong to any employers or other entities. Thanks for listening. Hey, listeners. If you've been listening to our show, chances are you've heard the wonderful contributions of our favorite Tolkien scholar, Marilyn R. Pukila. Marilyn just launched her own podcast on our network called Rings and Rituals. Join me and Dr. Sarah Brown on our journey through the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power, through the lens of ritual. Episodes drop every other Wednesday on the Rings and Rituals feed linked in the show notes. See you there.